14th episode of the 1796 Podcast, a monthly podcast that features exclusive interviews and in-depth news about the Tennessee National Guard and the Tennessee Military Department. The 1796 Podcast is produced every month by the Airmen and Soldiers of the Tennessee National Guard Joint Public Affairs Office. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Malone. And I'm Captain Hall, your co-hosts of the 1796 Podcast. This month, Colonel Randy Gordon, commander of the Arnold Engineering Development Complex, joins the podcast. Headquartered at Arnold Air Force Base in Tullahoma, Tennessee, the Engineering Development Complex is the epicenter for new airframe and missile technology for the Air Force. We'll hear all about it from Colonel Gordon. And of course, we'll brief you on the latest news impacting the Tennessee National Guard in our Tennessee Bluff news segment. First up, Lieutenant Colonel Malone sits down with Colonel Randy Gordon. Well, listeners, I am absolutely elated to be joined on the 1796 podcast today by Colonel Randy Laz Gordon. He is commander of Arnold Engineering Development Complex, headquartered at Arnold Air Force Base in Tullahoma, Tennessee. Colonel Gordon, welcome to the 1796 Podcast. Uh, Thanks. It's good to be here. We are thrilled to have you with us today. First off, tell us a little bit about your military adventure so far. How Mm -hmm. did you end up where you are as Commander of Arnold? So uh, if you've ever seen that movie Forrest Gump, uh, that's about how I ended up where I am right now. If I were to try to go back, uh, and this is probably a great like leadership lesson as I learned as well. Um, if, if I could go back and try to plan this career, it never would have worked out. Uh, it was just kind of being open to what was available, having a sense of where I wanted to be, and then just being open to what's available as, as opportunities presented themselves. So uh, again, I'm, I'm uh, Colonel Gordon, Randy Gordon. Uh, I go by Lazarus. Uh, they shortened it to Laz, uh, mainly because when I was a young officer, I survived what could have been a really, really bad aircraft accident. Uh, by just maybe a second or two to to spare, right? So it really taught me the value of life and being present and taking full advantage of what's offered up in front of you. I, I was going to ask about yeah. your call sign, but sometimes <laughs> I know that's a good story. Sometimes it's a bad story. So go ahead. Sorry. But broadly, I've been a career fighter pilot. Um, so I started off flying F-15s up in Alaska, which was a dream come true. Spectacular place. I think about Alaska every day of my life. Um, and then from that point forward, uh, I went into the test business. And then in the test world, Um, On average, um, so for instance, I I have about 78 now, 78 different airplanes I've had a chance to fly. And that's that's fairly common uh, for the world of flight test. So it's been really nice to, I started off as an F-15C guy, uh, but then as a tester, I still got a chance to fly the F-15C, but then I flew the F-15E model, uh, the F-16, the A-10, right? All models of both of those, right? The A-10 and the F-16. Um, I flew what's called a BD-700, which is a Global Express business jet, because we got a chance to be the first cadre of folks to take that airplane to Afghanistan Mm -hmm. way back in like the 2008 time frame. Um, I got a chance to fly the F-22 Raptor, which was a starship of a vehicle. It's fantastic. Um, And then uh, now I'm flying uh, with our team that we have in Holloman Air Force Base, um, where they have specially modified T-38s that we use for a variety of different flight test kind of programs that exist out there. So most of my career has kind of been in that world, but I've also served time as a, like a presidential fellow, and I got a chance to serve two different administrations, uh, presidential administrations for that. Um, I had a chance in the academic world to go on to get a PhD and to work in the world of, of strategy and see what that was all about. Um, I worked in the world of innovation uh, for the Air Force uh, back when we started up what, what's now called AFWorks. Um, but effectively, that was sort of like a venture capital group for the U.S. Air Force. And so I saw a lot of the business world that way. Um, I saw a lot of the business world through Harvard Business School and just getting a chance to meet some folks that were interesting there. I saw academia through MIT and uh, doing work with artificial intelligence. And so it's just been this mismatch of different kind of lives, if you will, uh, that arrived here. It's been a fantastic career. It's been fun. I've met some really awesome people. Uh, and uh, it, like I said, if I were to go back and try it all over again or try to plan it, it never would have worked out. So, you know, if there's one piece of advice I would have for people, it's to, it's to be uh, strategically focused, right? Like I, I knew I wanted to be an officer. I knew I wanted to fly and do those sorts of things, but tactically flexible, right? In terms of what comes open and what's, what's available to you. That's awesome. I- yeah. Wow, there's so much there that I, I wanted to ask more questions, and I, I think I've got. I think no, maybe we'll hit on those yeah. as we get to please them. Please do. So, yeah, um, I'll stick with my script for now. So, <laughs> next question. Uh, um, let me get some semantics figured out. Sure. You're commander of Arnold Engineering Development Center mm-hmm. uh, Complex. Yep. But it's also Arnold Air Force Base. Yeah. Why the difference? So it's interesting. Uh, this is the headquartered hub 
of what is the Arnold Engineering Development Complex. And it spans all the way from the coast of California all the way over to Maryland. Got it. Uh, and just about every place in yeah. between. Uh, it is a grab bag gumbo stew of different capabilities mm -hmm. that have all been kind of wrapped under this umbrella. So we do everything from uh, space test. Uh, the way they described it to me is that if it flies in the air, if it's, you know, the engine that goes into that thing that flies through the air, it has some work that was done here somewhere along the way. We'll do directed energy testing. We do landing gear testing. We do survivability testing. Like we'll literally shoot things into vehicle structures just to see how well it survives. Uh, we've got a climactic lab, which is down at uh, Eglin Air Force Base, and that tests anything from Arctic conditions all the way to desert conditions. So it is a it is a fantastic array of different capabilities that are all under the Arnold Engineering Development Complex, but it is headquartered here in Tennessee, right at Arnold Air Force Base. So we're named after Hap Arnold. Awesome. So the complex is complex, yeah. is yep. what you're saying. Yeah, the complex is <laughs> yeah. complex, and I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna use that by the way. <laughs> That's actually a good way to kind of phrase you're it. Welcome. <laughs> All right. So what you, what units are at Arnold under the complex or at the base sure. as part of that that infrastructure and that, yeah, we, that system? We predominantly on the testing side, we've got three main kind of focus areas. Um, one is our our wind tunnels that we do, which are pretty amazing. Uh, that the term I heard is is world unique. Uh, kind of capabilities here at Arnold. So we have wind tunnels. Uh, so we have one squadron that's set aside for that. And that there's a whole variety of different things that they do in wind tunnels for various different programs. Um, we have uh, engine test tunnels. So we'll put everything in there from gigantic turbofan engines to, you know, afterburning fighter jet kind of class of engines. Uh, and then we have our space test unit that sits here as well. Um, and they do everything from, you know, can I get it to orbit? what happens to it when it's on orbit and then when it brings back down from orbit um, my, my space test unit effectively does all that type of work gotcha so um all that happens here at Arnold. And mm -hmm. if you look at a map of the base, Arnold yep. Air Force Base in Tennessee, it, it's kind of big. And yeah. There's a lot of green area, yep. one kind of small developed area. Yep. What, why the difference? The way I best describe it is it's one integrated whole. So you have what we would call the mission area, which is all the, the big buildings that you would see on like a Google Earth or whatever. And that's where a lot of the work that we're talking mm -hmm. about actually happens. Uh, but the other side of the base tends to be a little bit more like, you know, forested, rural, whatever. And there's a gigantic lake that mm -hmm. sits on one side of it there. To the un untrained observer, it looks like it's just a lake. And it is, right? We, we fish out there. You can do um, any type of sporting, like, you know, water ski or pontoon boats or camping. All of that happens there. Uh, but one of the reasons why Arnold was built here, um, really for two gigantic reasons, uh, one is water, and then the other one is power. Uh, because the origins of the base, if I could talk a little bit about that, because it, it explains why this is all one integrated whole. If I go all the way back to World War II and the start of World War II, uh, the German Luftwaffe was fantastically ahead of just about any other air force on the planet period dot. Mm -hmm. And in some capabilities, even the Japanese Air Force, right, the Imperial Japanese Air Force, they, they were well ahead technologically, right, compared to where the other services were. So one of the things that really came out of that is that, and it's, it's kind of unusual, but it's 100% true, um, aviation was invented in the United States. That's the Wright brothers, right? We mm -hmm. built that, right? But the other nations around the world took that invention and really accelerated it while we languished behind. And where that really bit us was the dawn of World War II. General Arnold, right, five-star general, fantastic leader. You know, his picture hangs up everywhere around here. Him and a man named Theodore von Karman, one of the big-time scientists of the time, in the years after World War II, came together and said, that can never happen again, right? There can never be a point where we are strategically surprised in that manner. And it was their vision that ultimately became the Arnold Engineering Development Complex. And Operation Paperclip, which was effectively how we, uh, you know, post-World War II, um, procured uh, <laughs> German scientists mm -hmm. and German equipment. A lot of that equipment came here to Tullahoma, Tennessee, right? Manchester, Tennessee, and Winchester, like that kind of region. Mm -hmm. A lot of the scientists went to Huntsville, mm -hmm. right? And that became the dawn of our space program, places like Huntsville or, or White Sands Missile Range. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons, when, when they knew the type of equipment that they wanted to build here, it was very, very clear that for any of that equipment to work, we need a gigantic infrastructure support network so the Tennessee Valley Authority with the electrical power that came about from that, and then also the need to have coolant water, um, which, you know, our lake is really a, a dammed up river, right, that it, we use that for coolant water mm -hmm. for all of the gigantic right. 
turbine machinery gear that we have sitting out here. So there's a tunnel that essentially goes a couple miles from the lake that comes all the way up here that feeds that coolant water right here. As far as I know, we're the only Air Force base that has a dam, right? right so it's kind of yeah. neat, right, <laughs> that uh, we have that capability. It's all built to be able to feed and do all that all together. So a gigantic landmass, um, but designed specifically so that everything works as an integrated whole to effectively deliver power and water to all of our gear that we need to be able to run the, the equipment. Perfect. Awesome. So so let me, let's me let talk a little bit about the base also. Sure. So um, I know you share some of the property, or you're the, you're the yeah. uh, landlord, if you will. You, <laughs> you have a tenant here that is the Army National Guard for yep. Tennessee. Uh, it's about 7,300 acres, and I know they've got ranges out there. Yep. What's that relationship like, and do you get to fire on the range? It's great. One, uh, I'm a super gun nerd, and uh, when I saw the gun range, I was like, this is the best gun range <laughs> I've ever seen in my life. They do an amazing amount of work there, um, and it's it's actually it's, it's a very beautiful range, and so we're really proud of that partnership yeah. with the Tennessee Army Guard there uh, to make that happen. And yes, we've been out there to go shoot, awesome. uh, and yes, I'm hoping to go back there and shoot again <laughs> here relatively soon. It was a, It was a good time. But yeah, we, we do the partnership with them, and uh, we're, we're very happy for that. Um, and we actually want to really expand that up, right, and provide some additional support to them just based awesome. on the training that they need, right, that they can't really get anywhere else. So, so you're talking about some of the history there. Yeah. Let, let me hit on that, too. Historically, the Air National Guard used to fly C-130s in and out of here. I think mm-hmm. it was their drop zone. Yep. And then I heard that the runways was closed for a while. Yep. I've heard that it's open yep. now. Yep. What's How did that happen? How's that come about? What do you fly in and out? Do you get to fly in yeah. and out? Yeah, so I don't get to fly in and out yeah. yet. Um, it is uh, an airfield. It is a very bare bones kind of airfield, but we opened it mainly to provide another way for customers to be able to deliver, you know, t- you know test items mm-hmm. here back and forth. So yes, the, the runway is back open again. Uh, we've got procedures for how to get in and out of it. Um, it's not for public use, mm-hmm. right? But it's sure. for very specific use and for a very limited time frame. But yeah, we, we did that mainly to, to, to just have another logistical way for people to deliver materiel right here yeah. back and forth. Awesome. So again, more history. The predecessors of Arnold Air Force Base were Camp P and yep. Camp Forest yep. and B-24s and B-25s and yeah. P-31s flew in and out of here. I know that the Rangers that stormed the beaches of Normandy that that landed between Utah and Omaha, Point de Hoc, trained here. Yep. Why is it important that we remember that history? Oh, yeah. It's it's a fantastic question. One, um, I've I've been serving now for about 25 different years, right, in the Air Force, and uh, I've been in a lot of different bases. I've never in my life and times encountered such wonderful support from the community for the base. Uh, and for a lot of folks, right, Arnold, or, right, or the previous iterations, right, of Camp P, Camp Forest, um, that represents the U.S. military to them. The, the generational ties that people have with the military heritage here, is, it runs deep. It mm-hmm. runs really, really deep. So uh, for any folks that are listening, uh, and if you're within that kind of, <laughs> you know, area in and around the, the base and around Arnold, um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you uh, for the support that you give to the men and women that work out here. That heritage is really, really important because you start really understanding the support that the community provides to Arnold. That's always been a case here, right? Even in the days of Camp Forest, the support was was very, very strong, right? Camp P, Camp Forest area. Uh, I, I was really amazed to learn one about the Rangers, right? And I, I've been to, mm-hmm. you know, Normandy Beach, and you look, and w- what amazed me about that place is the scars in the hillside are still visible today, and here we are, you know, many, many, many decades removed from that, and the, just the level of carnage and devastation that happened there. You still get a sense of just the ferocity of the fighting that happened there. Um, so anyone that was involved in that campaign immediately has my my great respect. And so when I learned about the Rangers training here, that was, wow, you know, what an important heritage to keep alive. Um, I also learned that uh, General Patton trained here, right, and actually converted part of Manchester High School to one of his headquarters buildings when he trained up here. Um, Sergeant York of World War I fame, um, his son trained here, right, during the World War II era. Uh, and then to your point, uh, Tullahoma Airport, which I think was a northern airport right back in the time, was what it was called, which was named after the first uh, Tennessee uh, person to die in combat, right? Well, d- die in training, right? Mm-hmm. It was an aviation accident that happened um, off the coast of California. But that was a site where B-24s, right, were, were you know, big training event. So the reason why all that really matters to me, one, I'm, I'm a gigantic history nerd, and any one of those events were just like, wow, I can't believe that occurred mm-hmm. here and how neat that was. Um, but especially as a commander, you realize that you've been entrusted with this jewel of a national capability, and you know it's your job to kind of keep that, that memory alive, that story alive. You, you really see that when you kind of go through the back areas of the base, and you still see some of the original roads that were back there for Camp Forest, Camp P. 
Um, so it's it's a living, breathing history because there's still many people that live in the area that um, either served here when it was called that, or their parents or their grandparents mm-hmm. were mm-hmm. part of it. So it's it's a living, breathing history that is still here and still with us. And the need to kind of keep that alive is nice, right? To be able to yeah. kind of show, hey, this is what Central Tennessee, right, does for the nation. And even if it was delivering, you know, capability in World War II for things like Normandy, right, or today, right, with all of the technology that we develop for, you know, this big fight that we anticipate, you know, in this great power competition, um, all that kind of happens here. So it's, it's a really important heritage to keep alive. Oh, excellent information, sir, about what Arnold has provided and continues to provide for the nation. And if you don't mind, I think that's a great place for us to take a break and kick it over to Captain Hall for the news. Captain Hall? Up first this month in the Tennessee Bluff, more than 90 local high school students from the Coffee County area participated in a career day at the Tennessee Army National Guard Armory in Tullahoma in early April. Two groups of students from Coffee County Central and Tullahoma High Schools volunteered to spend the day learning about what the Tennessee National Guard does for the community and opportunities available to them following high school. Students had the opportunity to look at equipment and talk with guardsmen from a variety of career fields about future opportunities. And in other news, the 118th Operations Group based at the 118th Wing in Nashville is participating in one of the largest combat exercises in decades. The exercise is taking place in the Philippines and surrounding waters in the South China Sea and the Taiwan Strait. More than 12,000 U.S. military personnel, along with more than 5,500 Filipino and Australian forces, are participating in the exercises. The drills will include naval, air, and ground forces from all three nations. That's our Tennessee Bluff for this month. Up next, the second half of Lieutenant Colonel Malone's interview with Colonel Gordon. Thank you, Captain Hall. All right, Colonel Gordon. So you talked about technology yeah. and, and how y'all, Arnold has a big footprint in that. Yeah. In in your career, you were part of Air Force AI Accelerator, mm-hmm. and we don't need to get in. I know AI has been in the news a lot lately. Oh yeah, completely. We don't necessarily need to dig into that today, but yeah. Tell us what's going on that how the Air Force will be using AI as we go forward. Yeah. Maybe a little bit. The short story on that is uh, I got a chance to be a part of AFWorks which was a uh, initiative by the Air Force to partner up the U.S. Air Force with academia and with businesses uh, because we realized that the technology industrial base, so long as it was the gig- gigantic defense contractors, uh, we were missing a-, a lot of other things that were happening in the civilian world that the Air Force could really utilize, right? And, and that was wildly successful, right? It was, it was the startup that actually worked and survived <laughs> in the government, which I'm super proud of. Right. And I, I really love that team and what we were able to accomplish from there. The spinoff of AFWorks was to say, okay, we did that broadly over a, a lot of different areas that the Air Force was interested in. One thing that uh, Secretary of the Air Force at the time, Secretary Wilson, was really interested in is, is artificial intelligence. Uh, and I, I give her a lot of credit because what she understood is that if we want to be able to like jumpstart this for the Air Force, that the best thing we could do is to partner with an institution that is world class in the world of artificial intelligence. And then that was MIT, mm-hmm. right? MIT has this long, long history of working with the Department of Defense. You know, it's funny. So Harvard and so MIT and Harvard. There was an interesting story that they were working on radar technology in World War II, and then also jamming technology for radar in World War II. Neither institution knew that, and they realized that they were actually interfering with with each other's work <laughs> at the time. But the the partnership that MIT has with the DoD goes goes way way back. One thing that people always kind of get in their minds the moment you associate military with artificial intelligence is the Terminator series <laughs> right. of movies, yeah. right? Everyone always always has that in the back of their mind, and I spent a good deal of my time trying to divorce that myth. Uh, because what you see in science fiction is is very like fantastic, right? Scary, right? all those sorts of things. But in reality, uh, what I come to find out is AI um, in your civilian life, you deal with AI all the time. So the moment you log into Netflix and it shows you, mm-hmm. uh, hey, these are the movies we think you might like. Well, that's that's AI, right? Um, TurboTax, right, is a form of AI, mm-hmm. a simpler one, but it's it's mm-hmm. AI, right? Um, any of the music services you like, th- those are all AI-enabled kind of things, right? Google, for instance, and most recently, ChatGPT, mm-hmm. right, which has made all of the rage as of late. So in your civilian world, you're very comfortable and very used to dealing with AI, even if it's behind the scenes. 
in the military, maybe not so much, right? Like, because our traditional way of solving problems was to throw more people at it. Mm -hmm. And then we kind of realized we're kind of reaching the limit of what that might be. And oh, by the way, our adversaries are being very savvy about incorporating AI. So then really the question became of if artificial intelligence is rolling out, do we want that AI developed with our ethics and our values? Or do we want an adversary nation to develop it with their ethics mm -hmm. and their values? And we all know where that could kind of mm -hmm. lead. Um, so one, I, I thank MIT for partnering with the Air Force. Two, I thank the Air Force for being smart enough to recognize that we need to partner with a place like MIT. Uh, and the whole idea was, can we go solve airmen and guardian problems by taking the best and brightest AI research and then very rapidly adapting that for like a military application? I think we've been pretty successful, right, in trying to get a part of that. So it, it's nice. Um, most of the work that we did had to deal with, can we make the workload lighter, right, for airmen in terms of just basic day-to-day -day things that you do, like scheduling, mm -hmm. right, for, for instance, you know, can I attach an AI engine to something like that? Um, can I use AI to be able to help simplify um, like regulations or to make it easier to search and find like mm -hmm. the types of things that you're typing and looking at? So, so we effectively found uh, kind of the early stages of what you would see now as a chat GPT kind of capability, but we worked with some of the best and brightest uh, to be able to do that. The other thing that we did is, um, you know, to be frank, when I went to MIT, I couldn't spell AI, <laughs> right? Um, and we also appreciate that we have a lot of military folks that have been asked to, like AI is like this cure-all that's going to solve everything, right? And in, in reality, there's great limitations mm -hmm. on AI. Can we actually create an institution where we can make a DOD-tailored course that people can attend and get education, right, as to what AI actually is and can we create fellowships for the total Air Force, right? Not just active duty, but total Air Force to be able to go to MIT, right? Work for a few months with MIT on a project that you really care about um, and to be able to have access to all the facilities and capabilities that are a place like MIT and bring that back. So it's, it's a multi kind of fold thing. One is the technology development. One is also the education side of it too, which we thought both of those were really important missions for the Air Force to do. All right, listeners, you heard it. Airmen and soldiers out there, Look for those opportunities. Right. Absolutely. So we'll get practical for a minute. What are some MWR assets and some resources that are available here? If a veteran's driving by or a yep. National Guardsman, what could they benefit yeah, from well, around here? First of all, the, the, the landscape down here yeah. is breathtakingly nice. It's it gorgeous. Is. And I'm learning that springtime is my favorite time in Tennessee. Because uh, after you go through the winter and you get it, see everything kind of bloom again, it is fantastic. Uh, we are a sportsman's paradise. Mm -hmm. um, so you can come down here. Uh, we have the Wingo Lodge, which is uh, open and available. We have cabins that are available on the lake. Boating types of activities, we're all for that. So we've got pontoon boats and, you know, different types of speed boats and that sort of thing. Stand-up paddle boards. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's all fun uh, that way as well. During the hunting season, this is a big area for that as well. So, uh, you know, we're open for that. And then we've got great support from the local community in terms of different uh, MWR types of events. Uh, so whether that's skydiving or hang gliding, right, those types of yeah. things that we're trying to do and, and get people back in there, horseback riding, um, all that's available to us here. And the hiking here, incidentally, is, I guess, it's, it's, it's some of the best I've ever done. Cool. Um, every trail ends in a waterfall, <laughs> right? Oh, wow. And it's, it's yeah. nice that way. Uh, not to mention all the like just the gigantic kind of corporations that are in the area, like the Jack Daniels mm -hmm. or Barrett or you know mm -hmm. Black Rifle Coffee, mm -hmm. right? All those things they're, they're all around here, and it, it's it's just been really really nice to to live in the state. Very cool. So in preparing for today's interview, I I, I looked online for you mm -hmm. and I saw an, uh, a video <laughs> at Air Force Works. Yeah, and you mentioned Brigadier General John Flanagan. Oh yeah. What kind of influence did he have on you, and why is it important for us to have people like that? You bet. When you get accepted to the Air Force Academy, uh, I came from the state of New York. Mm -hmm. John Flanagan was a guardsman in New York. Uh, he was active duty in Vietnam, right? Transitioned out, became a guardsman. He was the first uh, one. He was the first general I'd ever seen in my life, mm -hmm. right, as a young guy getting ready to join the Air Force. And he was also the first pilot, right, that I ever saw, like Air, like Air Force pilot, right? Uh, John flew... Uh, what's called the O-1 Bird Dog, which is really not that much different than your just plain run-of-the-mill Cessna mm -hmm. that he flew in Vietnam as what we would call an air observer. Mm -hmm. So he was the one that would, uh, he would be a forward air controller. He would uh, get to the target area and he would mark on the ground where all the bad guys were so that the F-4 Phantoms and F-105s and whatever else flying over top knew where the where the bad guys were and they could drop the bombs on the target. Uh, he did that in a unarmed Cessna, <laughs> right, over Vietnam uh, when everyone else was there flying a supersonic twin-engine mm -hmm. fighter jet, you know, that could zoom in, zoom out, and right. he was still there. So 
the courage, right, of, of Flanagan and all the air observers, the forward air controllers is just off the world incredible. John was a huge influence on me just for sake of the fact that, you know, he was an Air Force officer. He was a general. I didn't know the difference between guard or reserve or sure. whatever. I just saw an Air Force guy in uniform with, you know, one star rank sitting on his shoulders. Uh, and then I also just knew a little bit of his story about what he flew and just how cool that was. Um, he was the nicest, most approachable guy, right? And he wrote this beautiful book. Uh, that you can get online. It's it's really well written. Um, it's basically an aviator story. You know, Vietnam above the treetops was the name of his book, um, and it was it was just great to see a little bit of that story and to realize the service that I was about to join that it would have men like like John Flanagan in it. So I I really appreciated missing him. Unfortunately, he passed away. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it's, it really kind of speaks, he, I, I guarantee it, he doesn't re- remember me from Adam. I guarantee that, right? He ran into a whole bunch of different folks that particular day, but I, I do remember him very, very vividly. And so maybe another leadership lesson is, Hey, you know, the people that you talk to, again, they, you, to you, it might just seem like a Tuesday, right? To them, it's like meeting, you know, like their greatest celebrity hero, whatever along the way. Uh, and the, the influence that you can have with just a few minutes of your time is, is fantastic. I think you've had some influence on our time today. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. And I'll give you one last opportunity. And we'd like to ask our, our guests that come on if they've got some leadership behind them. What's their hmm. best piece of leadership advice? And you've given us some already. Yeah. Do you have another one you could give us a nice nugget? So another person that was a huge influence on me was a lady named Mae Jemison, uh, who was our first African-American female astronaut. Um, she flew in the early 1990s, only flew once, but then went off to do a lot of different things in uh, different career fields. Um, you know, I'll give you the very short story, again, just to talk about the influence that you can have. Uh, so I, I, was, I was terrified of joining the U.S. Air Force. I thought I wasn't good enough. Uh, I thought there was no way they would ever accept me to the Air Force Academy. I thought cadets were like living gods. Mm-hmm. Um, in reality, they're not. You know? <laughs> but you know, to a, a guy growing up in upstate New York sure. like me, uh, you know, where we, we really didn't have a lot of Air Force bases there. There was a time when there was a lot there, but that was a Cold War thing. A lot of bases closed in the Northeast. Mm-hmm. We just don't have a lot left out mm-hmm. there. So, you know, again, this is why a guy like John Flanagan was such a big deal to me, right? Because when I met him, I was like, holy crap, it's a guy in the Air mm-hmm. Force. Wow, he's a general. Wow, yeah. he's a pilot. Wow, imagine that, you know, kind of thing. Uh, but this lady, Mae Jemison, she came to West Point, New York uh, after her shuttle flight. And so what West Point, New York did is that for the local communities, they would advertise, hey, we have these guest speakers coming in. And if you want to come up, just show up, walk up to the hall, sit down, right? Don't be disruptive, but, you know, you're welcome, right? Come on out, take a look to see what you have. Mae Jemison, uh, I had never met anyone like that in my life. She was a scientist. She was an astronaut. She was a medical doctor. She was a ballerina, <laughs> right? Um, and so she had all these different parts of her life that were, it was just, just amazing, right? Just to sit there and just listen to her. I guarantee you, she doesn't remember, know me from Adam either, right? But again, I'm just a young kid sitting up in the audience watching all this. Uh, and the thing that she really impressed upon me is the reason she was able to do all those different things in life is because she was never in the position to tell herself no. Like if she really wanted to go do something, she was just gonna go do it. And she was gonna make the other people tell her that she couldn't do it, but she wasn't going to be the one to tell herself no. So if she wanted to, you know, be a medical doctor, she was just going to do it, right? And she was going to apply and she was going to make those people tell her no, Mm -hmm. right? And Mm -hmm. so what I really pulled from that was that whole concept of never be the one to tell yourself no. Uh, that you don't let the the voices in your head overcome you or, you know, you don't talk yourself out of it if you think it's something you really want to go do with your life. You just go do it, right? And if they tell you no, okay, got it, right? Keep pressing. Uh, We talked about MIT, right? It took me 17 years for the Air Force to finally let me to go to MIT. (laughs) 17 years. Like the first time I tried it, they told me no, right? And they told me no many times. And at 17 years, I finally got a chance to go. And it was worth every penny. Um, It took me 10 years to get to the F-22, right? And they told me no multiple times on that. And eventually life worked out and I got to the Raptor, right? And it was great. Um, But all that I traced back to me being that little kid sitting in the audience and listening to Mae Jemison relay this amazing story. And, you know, her whole point is the only reason any of that happened is because I I just went and did it, right? I, I I didn't wait for someone to tell me or give me permission. I just did it. Um, and made them tell me no, right? And she was surprised at how many doors opened just for having the gumption to try, right? It's the fortune favors the bold yeah. kind of argument. Yeah. So, so that would be the other argument, you know, the other lesson I would leave for your listeners is, is that, right? Of, of not being afraid of going after the things you want to go do in life. That's awesome. So, so West Point had... Yeah. 
guest speakers. We have podcasts. Yeah. And so some people get to hear you today. So yeah. you've given us leadership. You've given us history. You've given us practical information about Arnold Air Force Base. Yeah. So honored that you, that you spoke. Now, this is great. This Thank was fun. Thank you very much. Yeah, come back anytime. Love to. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the 1796 Podcast. If you like what you heard, please consider subscribing, sharing this episode with friends, and giving us a five-star review. The 1796 Podcast is produced by the Tennessee National Guard Joint Public Affairs Office. For more information, please visit www.tn.gov backslash military.